So let's talk about hemochromatosis. This is such an important subject, and especially in Europe, and I'm going to explain why. First, let me defi define the term hemochromatosis. Hemochromatosis basically means iron overload. It basically means that. So you can get to iron overload or hemochromatosis by two ways, either genetic or hereditary hemochromatosis or non-genetic factors. And the genetic factors, when I was in med school in the 1990s, they told us that hereditary hemochromatosis was a very rare disease. Yes. Uh, they only found out about the genetics where the, the gene mutation happened in the 90s. So I remember when I was in med school that they came up this big thing that, oh my God, they found the gene. And it's called the HFE gene. That's where most of the mutations happen. So there's three different uh, mutations. There's the HFE, there's the C282Y. So if somebody did their 23andMe, they will give you all your genes, all your SNPs. Um, you can do any other genetic places and go and look for those. So there's three mutations that can affect iron physiology and cause hemochromatosis, hereditary hemochromatosis. The most common is C282 white mutation. Second most common is H63D. And they even found a third one now recently, S65C. But the first two are the first two most important ones. The more um, dangerous one is the first one, C282Y. And if you have a homozygous, meaning both alleles, you got it from both of your parents, it's a recessive trait. You need to get it from both of your parents. That's when you have true pathologic hemochromatosis. And that's mm -hmm. what most hematologists focus on. People who are he homozygous for the c 282 white HFE gene, those people have a high risk of developing iron overload or hemochromatosis. And those people can have, um, there was a triad that I learned in med school. They have diabetes because iron deposits in the pancreas. They get cirrhosis because it deposits in the liver. And they get bronze skin, their, 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 their skin. So it affects the skin a lot. So that triad was always in almost in every board question. What's that triad? Hereditary hemochromatosis. So now we found the gene. And it is way more common than, than I thought. So in the US, homozygous c 2 a affects about 0.5% of the population. 0.5 mm. or 360 million, it's a good amount. So we yeah. think there's 1.5 million of people with homozygous hemochromatosis that are not diagnosed. And that there was a high possibility of iron overload. Then you can have heterozygous c 2 2 y So if you're heterozygous, the hematologist will tell you, you don't have hemochromatosis. You're only a carrier. And this is where I completely disagree. And the studies are showing that this is not true. Even if you have one gene and you are put in an environment where there's too much iron, if you drink alcohol, and if you do other things, like for example, testosterone increases iron stores. If you take supplements that have too much iron, even one gene out of the two can predispose you to have a higher mm -hmm. level. And I'm yeah. gonna give you a, a quick little example of a patient that I saw is actually from Belgium. No, I'm sorry, he's from, from the UK, then lived in Belgium. Mm -hmm. And he developed diabetes at the age of 35, but he drank a lot of alcohol, almost four to eight pints of beer from the age of 15. So in 20 years, he always did that, never had a problem. Developed severe diabetes, A1C, difficult to control at 35, 20 years of drinking. And you know, they told him, yes, the alcohol, it could be no genetic predisposition. They didn't know. And his main symptoms was fatigue, chronic fatigue, and joint pain. Diabetes doesn't give you that much chronic fatigue and joint pain. When I saw him, after he saw so many patients, I checked his iron. His ferritin was about 800. He's, remember, less than 400 is what's normal, optimal less than 100. His iron saturation, transfer saturation, was 60%, should be less than 50. So right there, I was like, you have an iron problem. Uh, but drinking alcohol by itself can increase your ferritin. Then I sent him for the genetic testing. And he had one out of two, the two alleles. Mm -hmm. I sent him to a hematologist. The hematologist was like, oh, no, when you have one, you don't absorb iron. I called the hematologist. I told him I don't agree. He has high iron. Yes, maybe the environment of drinking a lot of alcohol expressed that phenotype. But he had it because he had high iron. And now the higher iron not only affected his pancreas, we checked his liver, he had fatty liver, we checked his testosterone, he had low T, because iron accumulates, the first place it usually accumulates, it's in the pancreas, the liver, and the pituitary. So iron will deposit in the anterior pituitary where the gonadotrophs are. 
gonadal troughs are what secrete LH and FSH. So as we get more iron, it, it decreases your LH and FSH. So high iron is very tightly um, linked to low testosterone, secondary hypogonadism, infertility, and ED. So mm -hmm. what's bad with the deposits of iron in the pituitary, it happens early. They've done study, autopsy studies, because we don't have any MRI that can detect that. And they've seen that even from the age of 30 years old in the general population, iron starts depositing in the pituitary. And that's how it decreases your, your testosterone long term. So pituitary iron is really, really important. There's no way to check for it. But high iron, so this patient, what I did with him, I put him on a, on a plan of blood donation. Once his ferritin went below 300, felt so much better. His chronic fatigue improved. His joint pains improved. His diabetes was improving. You know, he still needs all of the treatment. Unfortunately with him, we checked what they call a C-peptide and it showed that it was such an aggressive diabetes. His body was not making any more insulin. Mm. When it comes to his testosterone, also same thing. A lot of times when it's long-standing iron toxicity, you may not be able to reverse it because it's been deposited so long it causes fibrosis. Yeah. So this guy had diabetes, um, fatty liver, low testosterone, abnormal sperm count, and erectile problems. What was the root cause of all this? Iron overload. Yeah. If, you, if that patient came to see me three years ago, I would say the root cause of all this is low testosterone. Yeah. But we need to go deeper. When we went deeper, we saw the so a lot of patients may be diagnosed with all of those other things, and we never go to the iron. Yeah. So iron is really, really important. So let's go back to hemochromatosis. So you have the C2A2I, heterozygous or homozygous, H63D. This tends to be a, a better prognosis if you have this, whether it's homozygous or heterozygous, you tend to have less iron absorption. And the last one is S65C. So when you do your 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 gene testing. You look at if you have a variant in any of those. Once you look at the variant, now you look at your iron labs. Because it doesn't matter what your genes say. You need to know what's in your blood. When you put them together, you have a better idea. Mm -hmm. uh, another example that I have, this guy was from Finland. This guy was homozygous for C282. He had both alleles. His ferritin was in a 1,000 when he was diagnosed. And he's been donating blood. His ferritin usually is the 120s now. Try, I told him to try to get it below 100. But this guy, because he's always, always has a really good lifestyle, never drink alcohol. He was 62. He has muscles on him. Uh, he eats well because he's from um, uh, Finland. He was doing sauna three to four times a year. That's been shown to help with iron overload. He had no disease. Mm -hmm. Although his ferritin on diagnosis was 1,000, he's, he's never had diabetes, never had low T because he's, he, he was diagnosed in his early 30s before iron overload caused the damage. So it does it. So you could think that this guy was homozygous. He's going to have worse disease than the guy that was heterozygous. It all depends on the environment also. Yeah. Okay. So, Very interesting. And if we think about European patients, in Northern Europe, it's about there's way more prevalence of hemochromatosis gene. We think that it originated in the Viking area, and it's called actually the Celtic curse. Mm -hmm. Because it's Northern European ancestry, although it's disseminated throughout the world. But you look at, for example, in Ireland, the incidence of having C282Y, one out of the two is about 20%. General population in the UK is about 10 to 12%. So there's about 12% of people in the UK who may have one gene for hemochromatosis, and they don't know that. The more you yeah. drink alcohol, the more iron you accumulate. So for some people, even two or three pints with a gene for hemochromatosis, is bad. So anybody should know their iron status, especially if you have Northern European ancestry. Mm. So this is genetic or hereditary hemochromatosis. But yeah. you can have non-hereditary hemochromatosis, meaning that you have iron overload without having any genes for it. First, we're just discovering what genes are coding for this. We just found out a third gene recently. We may find out more genes in the future. But let's say you check your levels. Your ferritin is 500. Your iron saturation is 52%. Your genes are completely normal. Mm -hmm. You still have iron overload. What yeah. may be causing it, it may be that you're taking too much iron in your diet. It may be that you take things that suppress hepcidin, testosterone being one of them. If you take testosterone and growth hormone, 
they suppress hepcidin because they want to make muscle grow. It's an anabolic treatment. So you remember the, that relationship. When you suppress hepcidin, the, 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 the lines of iron absorption are wide open. So you may have a high or normal iron stores, but you keep increase, you're absorbing from your diet and you keep recycling for your macrophages in your spleen. So all, all, when you take uh, testosterone, growth hormone, and other things like this, suppresses your hepcidin, you have a continued increase of iron despite normal stores. I think for everybody on testosterone right now, they need to hear that again. Testosterone suppresses hepcidin. Hemochromatosis is associated with a low hepcidin level. So testosterone causes physiologic hemochromatosis. And this is a paper that was done by Dr. Lipschultz and Dr. Um, Grenson, I think, published in 2018. And I will have that in my class. Um, the name of it is Iron and Sex Hormones, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And that was the first paper I actually contacted them. And they were like, it surprised them also. We knew that relationship. Again, hepcidin was only discovered in 2001. But once that is now there, anybody taking testosterone has a low level of hepcidin and will absorb more iron. So I looked at my iron over the past six years that I've been on testosterone. My ferritin was usually in the 80 to 120 range, and it went up to the 300. So I donate blood two to three times a year. Finally, I got my ferritin below 100. You want to check your levels two months after you donate. Uh, so I donate every four months, more or less. I check my iron levels usually on the third month. And based on where that is, I decide if I'll do an extra donation or not. And I'm maintaining my ferritin now below 100, 120. Sometimes it goes down to 60. But it's funny. And I followed my iron the past three years. And I steadily climbed. And now that I know about iron, I try not to eat a lot of carbs that are fortified with iron. I eat a good amount of red meat, but I don't get much iron from other places, but I've had a steady climb. And with those studies, I told you, I want to keep my ferritin below 200. So mm -hmm. when you think about hemochromatosis or iron overload, it's either you have hereditary hemochromatosis or you can have non-hereditary hemochromatosis. And if somebody finds that they have non-hereditary iron overload, or hemochromatosis, we need to try to figure out where are you getting extra iron from. Um, Centrum, the most used multivitamin in the US, has 18 milligrams of iron in it. Most protein shakes, protein bars, have about 18 to 25 milligrams of iron in it. So the RDA daily allowance is 8 milligrams. Let's mm. say you take a multivitamin and a protein bar, you're already at almost 35, 40 grams of iron, milligrams of iron. You're already yeah. taking too much iron. So you can accumulate. If you take testosterone, you will see a steady climb on your test, uh, on your iron. If you take growth hormone, a lot of those things, our birth control pills increases iron. So there are so many things, and I have all the list. So for me, my after reading all of this, what I do for myself and I recommend for my patients, know your iron status. Based on those studies, I want your ferritin to be less than 100. And your iron saturation to be not low, between 20 to 50, 20 to 45. Because when you have a good iron saturation, it means you still have enough iron for the essential functions of iron. Very mm -hmm. balanced. Then I take enough antioxidants to make sure that any ROS or oxidation that I have, I get. And, and those things we talked about. We know about the importance of antioxidants. And I monitor those blood tests. But everybody should know their iron status, even more if you're on testosterone, even more if you have Northern European descent, you should know your iron status. Mm. Awesome information. Thank you so much for sharing. Yes, uh, very new to me. Yes, yes. And, and let me talk again about blood donation really quick. So usually people are, are, are worried about blood donation. So blood donation is a very easy procedure. Um, in, in the U.S., we have the Red Cross. We have a private organization called One Blood. That's mostly where I go. And in the U.S., they take out about 450 ml per donation. Usually from that, you will lose about 25 to 50, 25 to 30 milligrams of iron. Um, so based on how high your ferritin is, you can calculate how many donations you will need to bring mm. your ferritin down. They allow you to donate usually every 50, every two months. So you could donate six times a year. Most people don't need that much. The studies are showing that frequent blood donors two to three times a year, that's when usually it's best and you monitor your ferritin. 
I tell patients, do not donate blindly. And something interesting also, when you go to the Red Cross or One Blood, they will check your blood to let you know if you can donate. And they will mm -hmm. usually tell you your iron level is 15. You're okay to donate. It's not the iron level that they're checking. They're checking the hemoglobin level. That's usually between 12 and 16. Um, if you're below 13, they won't let you donate. But the, the, the employees there keep saying, we check your iron. It's your hemoglobin. To check your iron, you need to request iron, TIBC, and ferritin. Yeah. Again, blood donation is very easy. Uh, you want to make sure that you stay well hydrated. Most people tolerate that well. Um, and yeah, so on patients that we need to donate more often, I usually have them donate every two months and monitor the levels. My patients who have ferritin of a thousand and plus, I usually will send them to my hematologist consultant because they can donate every week, every two days, as long as you monitor your level that you don't go below that level. So, yeah. and again, what's important for blood donation, you do something good for you and you do something good for the, for, for the world.